Hello, this is the second part of lecture four of linear algebra. And uh, in this part, we will continue our study of linear transformations. Okay, uh, let us fix n-dimensional space Rm and uh, m-dimensional space Rm. And let's consider some linear transformation from Rm to Rm and call it T. Then we know from the previous part of this lecture, then T is uniquely, completely determined by T of E1, T of E2, T of EN, where E1, E2, EN are standard basis vectors of our n-dimensional space. So if we know these n vectors in RM, then we can recover T. So what we can do, we can put these n vectors as a columns of a matrix. And this matrix is going to be a matrix that we can use to recover T uniquely. This is very important matrix. It is called the standard matrix of our linear transformation. By definition, this is M times N matrix. Its columns are these vectors, T of E1, T of E2, T of EN, and it's denoted like the square bracket T. Okay, this is M times N matrix whose ith column is T of EI. By definition, to cook up this matrix, you take a vectors E1, E2, EN, you apply your linear transformation T to them, you get N vectors in M dimensional space, you put them as a columns of a matrix and you call this matrix standard matrix of T. Okay, let's consider two examples. One example, the simplest possible, you take identity function. We already know it's linear transformation. What its standard matrix? Of course, one can guess this should be identity matrix. And this follows immediately from this definition. In this case, T of E1 is just E1. T of E2 is just E2. T of EN is EN. So you put in the columns of this matrix, you put E1, E2 up to EN, and then this is identity matrix. Okay, let's consider another example. You take a reflection in the X axis. So in coordinates, if you have vector X, Y, it, it is mapped to vectors X minus Y. Okay, so how to find its standard matrix? Very simple. You just take a first basis vector E1, 1, 0, and you, it is mapped by definition to the vector 1 minus 0. But of course, this is the same as 1, 0. So you put it as a first column. Then you do the same with the vector E2. You take vector 0, 1. It is mapped to vector 0 minus 1. Okay, you put it is the second column of this matrix. This is standard matrix of your linear transformation T in this example. Okay, let's consider two more examples. These examples you already met in the first part of this lecture. You take a, a, a two-dimensional space, you take a three-dimensional space, and you have this function uh, that take, goes from R2 to R3, defined by this formula. We proved already in the previous part of this lecture that this is a linear transformation. Let's now find its standard matrix. How to do this? Again, you take a vector one, zero here, and you take its image. You just substitute in this formula, x1 to be one, x2 to be zero. You get vector three minus four, zero. Next, you take vector e2, zero, one, where it is mapped by t. You substitute in this formula, x1 to be zero, x2 to be one. You get vector two, one, minus one. So you put these two vectors in the columns of your matrix, first and the second column, and you get this matrix. This is standard matrix of this linear transformation. This is quite straightforward. Consider another example, take orthogonal projection to the uh, linear span of the first two standard vectors and we know from the previous uh, part of this lecture that this is a linear transformation. Yeah, what it is, is it uh, what it's a uh, standard matrix? Okay, you take vector E1 uh, and then you apply T to E1. Okay, then E1 is already in this vector space. So when you orthogonally project 
any vector in the uh, vector space to this vector space you get the same vector so e1 goes to e1 so you put e1 here the first column then you do the same with the two you put e2 here yeah now it's time to consider the last standard vector uh, e3 you take vector e3 but e3 it's a vector with coordinate 0 0 1 it's orthogonal to vectors e1 and e2 so it means it's orthogonal to the span and then by definition of orthogonal projection it is mapped to zero so vector e3 is mapped to zero 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 okay we get this matrix it's very uh straightforward and uh, you have to practice and then you're going to remember this for the rest of your life now let us define the way how to construct a linear transformation from a matrix we fix a m times n matrix a and we define a function denoted by this funny looking symbol this is gothic t subscript a so this uh function depends on matrix a so this is i put it as subscript so we define this function gothic t a from n dimensional space to m dimensional space by this formula basically this is just multiplication by the matrix a you take a vector x in n dimensional space you multiply it by your matrix a and you get a vector in m dimensional space okay small remark important remark which i already mentioned many times so when you take this product ax what you get is a linear combination of columns of matrix a with coefficients entries of the vector x coordinates of the vector x okay this is just the linear combination of columns of the matrix a okay and of course this linear combination lives in m dimensional space okay uh, this is not just a function this is a linear transformation you have to prove this detailed proof is in the lecture notes but it's not complicated basically you have to check three main properties of the linear transformation zero goes to zero sum goes to sum x goes to uh, la uh, lambda times x goes to lambda times t of x once you check this you're done so for example we can immediately see that the first property is satisfied why take zero vector zero goes to a times zero but a times zero vector is zero vector so zero goes to zero we checked first property the remaining two uh, can be checked uh, in a similar way using uh, basic properties of matrix multiplication okay so let's consider our favorite example let's take uh, the case when m equals to n so matrix a is square and let's consider very special matrix a is an identity matrix which linear transformation correspond to the identity matrix of course it should be identity linear transformation uh, why okay let's just look at this formula you have a vector x and it is mapped to vector identity times x but identity times x is x so every vector x is mapped to itself so it's identity function yeah okay you see the pattern once we had identity function we took its standard matrix and it's an identity matrix vice versa you have identity matrix you take the function which correspond to this matrix defined by this formula and this is identity function this is not a coincidence of course okay let's consider two important examples one example may be familiar from a high school but maybe not if not this is absolutely okay we're going to consider this from scratch you take this uh, two by two matrix with a cosine and sine put it in this way yeah and then you define linear transformation which is given by multiplication by this matrix a like in the previous slide then geometrical meaning of this linear transformation is just a rotation around the origin by angle theta anti-clockwise so this is linear transformation that takes vectors in r2 maps them to r2 such that everything is just rotated around the origin by angle theta anti-clockwise to see why this is true just apply this to vector 
one zero. Take a vector one zero, looks like this. Yeah, it's on the x-axis, and just multiply it by uh, your matrix A. When you multiply vector uh, one zero by this vector, vector matrix A on the left, you get first column of this matrix, cosine theta, sine theta. This is a vector obtained by rotation uh, by angle theta anticlockwise from your vector one zero, just rotate that. Okay, this is very important example. You will see this matrix in many courses, in many applications, in this course, uh, in this lecture, and in, in the future. So you have to uh, remember this matrix. This is important matrix. Let's consider second example. Of course, this is a very familiar example, which we can consider it already twice in this lecture. Now we take a matrix A, three by two matrix A, like this, yeah. And we cook up a linear transformation, which is basically multiplication by this uh, uh, matrix. So it takes vectors in, in the plane, in R2, and when you multiply this matrix by this vector, you get a vector in R3, th three-dimensional vector. So it's basically by definition given by this formula, x1, x2 goes to this matrix A times x1, x2. You accurately multiply and you get this formula. Yeah, we already met this linear transformation. We know it's we know it's linear. We made this function twice already in this lecture. Okay, this basically shows you how to recover a linear transformation from a matrix. Yeah, okay, and this is of course a special case for some big pattern. This is an important result which we're going to use often, and uh, this is this theorem can be considered as a translation of uh, matrices into linear transformation, linear transformation into matrices. Using the theorem, we can translate a lot of results uh, about linear transformations into the language of matrices and a lot of results about matrices into the language of linear transformation. This is the first uh, important step in the bridge between linear transformations and matrices. Again, we have a linear transformation from Rn to Rm. We can cook up a matrix out of this, m times n matrix, which is a standard matrix of this linear transformation. So we go in this direction. Now we can do other way around. We can take a m times n matrix and we take a linear transformation obtained by multiplication by this matrix cooked up on the previous slide. Yeah, so we go in this direction. This theorem tells us that these two maps, these two correspondent, they match. So namely, if you take a linear transformation, you take a standard matrix, then you cook up a linear transformation out of the standard matrix, you get back the same linear transformation. And vice versa, you take a matrix A, you cook up a linear transformation, you take a standard matrix, you get back your matrix. Okay, this is very important result. I sketch the proof here, but uh, in a more detailed uh, form, this proof is available in the lecture notes. I strongly suggest to actually first try to prove this theorem by yourself and then look uh, for the detailed proof in the lecture notes. But the idea of the proof is not very uh, complicated. So for example, to prove this equality, what should we do? On the left hand side, there's a linear transformation. On the right hand side, there's a linear transformation. But we know that linear transformations are uniquely determined uh, by the values at standard basis vectors. So basically, if we apply left hand side and right hand side to every standard basis vector, and if you get the same vector, it means these two linear transformations are the same. Yeah, let's just do this. So for example, you apply it to vector EI. What does it mean apply left-hand side to the vector EI? By definition, it means you take this matrix, standard matrix of T, and you multiply it by EI. But when you multiply standard uh, matrix of T by EI, you got ith column of standard matrix of T. But ith column of standard matrix of T, it's exactly what 
what is by what it's equal by definition t of ei so when you apply t to ei so it show you that this guy is nothing but t applied to ei so these are the same linear transformations vice versa if you want to prove this equality when two matrices are equal if you only if the columns are equal yeah to each corresponding columns equal to each other so you can take vectors e1 e2 en standard, standard basis vectors of uh, n dimensional space and you just multi uh, multiply uh, this left hand side and right hand side to the, by these vectors because when you multiply matrix by the standard uh, vector ei you got ith column of this matrix okay so uh, we, yeah we can do it so for example if you multiply this uh if you multiply this matrix by vector ei what do you get you get ith column of this linear transformation but uh, ith column of this linear transformation by definition this is this linear transformation ith column of this of standard matrix of this linear transformation is by definition this linear transformation applied to this vector ei okay so ith column of this matrix is just this linear transformation gothic t subscript a applied to ei yeah on the other hand what is gothic uh, what is this linear transformation applied to ei by definition it's a times ei this is how we define this gothic t subscript a okay but this is the same if you apply a to multiply a to ei yeah so we proved that if you multiply left hand side and right hand side by ei you get the same vector but this vector is i column of the corresponding matrix so these two matrices matrices has the same column columns all columns are the same so it means the matrices are the same okay if this is too fast uh, read it later in the lecture notes this is important theorem okay uh, but this is not the end of the bridge this is not uh, this theorem on the previous slide didn't complete the bridge between matrices and uh, linear transformations we need a little bit more why because matrices comes with a multiplication we can multiply them similarly linear transformation we can compose so if we know that composition of linear transformations is a linear transformation this is stated by this lemma this lemma basically tells you that composition of linear transformations is a linear transformation how to prove it so first of all before proving this let's give you like intuitive uh, explanation why this is the case linear transformations between vector spaces are functions that are given by polynomials without constant terms you can express them in coordinates uh, explicitly as polynomials using polynomials without constant terms but composition of polynomials without constant terms is a polynomial with, uh, without constant terms so this is basically the reason uh, algebraic reason that stands behind this theorem but we can of course prove it by definition or by using the criterion for being linear transformation which we described in the first part of this lecture which is basically given by the three lines if you fix two numbers lambda and mu in uh, real numbers uh, two real numbers and then you take any two vectors x and y to prove that this is linear transformation it's enough to prove that uh, t compose u when you apply to lambda x plus mu y you get nothing but lambda times t compose u applied to x plus mu times t compose u apply to y we can prove this slowly using the fact that t is linear u is linear and using this criterion which i mentioned two times so we take t compose composition with u apply to this vector and then by definition this is first you apply u to this vector and then you apply t to this vector but when you apply u to this vector then you use the fact that u is linear and you use this criterion and you get this u applied to lambda x plus mu y this is the same as lambda u of x plus mu u of y and this proves this equality now 
you apply t to the sum and you use this criterion twice and uh, you get this but then you just observe that t of u of x this is nothing but t compose u applied to x and t up to y. T applied to u applied to y this is nothing but t compose u applied to y but this is exactly what we want to prove to apply this criterion third time you apply criterion third time you get this is a linear transformation okay so good let's consider uh, just one example to see how it works so let's consider rotation of the plane by the angle theta clock counterwise and uh, we know that this uh, linear transformation can be obtained as a multiplication by this matrix yeah this r theta this is gothic t a where a is this matrix yeah again this is important matrix all of you have to remember this matrix okay good now let's consider some other linear transformation let's consider orthogonal projection of the plane to the x-axis x-axis yeah so uh, this is the orthogonal projection to the span of the vector e1 e1 yeah so basically in coordinate x y goes to x0 very simple look at linear transformation yeah then we can observe that this orthogonal projection this is uh, can be obtained by the multiplication uh, by this matrix yeah again you just multiply this matrix b by the vector with coordinate x y and you get x zero vector yeah and okay so now we can compose these two uh, linear transformations in two different ways we can first rotate and then project or we can first project and then rotate uh it's going to be different things but i don't have space on the slide to put both of them both compositions so i only put one first uh, rotate and then project so again we take this composition you first rotate by the angle theta and then you project to the x-axis you accurately apply this composition to vector e1 and e2 and you get this this is a vector with coordinate cosine theta zero and this is vector with coordinate minus sine theta zero okay you just apply this uh formulas for this compositions yeah for for each of this linear transformation yeah and then you observe that the composition of these two maps two transformation composition of this two linear transformation this is of course we know that this is a linear transformation from the previous lemma but we also can observe that this is linear transformation that can be obtained by multiplication by the matrix c where c is just b times a this is not hard to see directly because if you just compose uh, this t a and t b you just multiply first by a first by b yeah but again this is not just coincidence this is part of the general slogan this is general slogan multiplication of matrices correspond to composition of linear transformation we have linear transformation on the left hand side matrices on the right hand side we already have this correspondences linear transformation and you take its standard matrix you have a matrix you take a linear transformation which given by the multiplication by this matrix matrices you can multiply linear transformation you can compose and all of this perfectly match okay basically it means that if you take composition of two linear transformation and you take its standard matrix this is the same as first take standard matrix of t and standard matrix of u and then multiply them of course in the same order okay this is very important and uh, uh, you can translate uh, this in the level of uh, matrices uh, a little bit different if you look from different uh, angle on this if you take a, a m times n matrix a if you have n times p matrix b you can multiply them because number of columns of a is the same as number of rows of b so you have as a result three matrices a b and a times b and then you can cook up three linear transformation this t a t b and t a times b and of course this t a times b it's a composition of t a and t b these two formulas are translation one into another 
using this main theorem we mentioned a few slides ago. If you translate one of this formula into the language of linear transformations, this formula into language of linear transformation, you get this formula. If you translate this formula into the language of linear uh, or matrices, you get this formula. But actually this formula, <laughs> it's a little bit easier, at least for me, a little bit easier to prove. Yeah, because it's almost by definition, you have to apply this to some vector, but how you apply, if you apply this to some vector V, you just multiply V by A times B. But if you apply this to V, you apply, uh, first multiply by B and then you apply, uh, multiply by A. And basically we know that multiplication of matrices are associative. So this gives you the same thing. Okay, and then using this, you can derive this by applying this translation theorem. Okay, now the bridge is built between basically this linear transformations and um, matrices. So this is very handy. This is very handy. Why? Uh, first of all, because linear transformations appears everywhere. But sometimes when you want to work with them, it was also some problem. It's easier if you translate this into language of matrices and then some problems become easier because matrices are something we get used to already. Vice versa, you may have a problem about matrices such that maybe it's not immediately easy to solve, but if you translate it into the language of linear transformation, maybe you can find solution easier. Okay, this is equivalent thing. It's just the way how our, our mind works. So it may, sometimes you work with matrices, it's easier. Sometimes you work with linear transformation, it's easier. But this uh, bridge, these two different languages, equivalent languages, basically can be used to solve problems. It's like being bilingual. You can actually speak two different languages. It's actually it may help. Okay, good. So let me consider one. A little bit specific example. I, I, I'm a bit sorry that one number is just too large. So anyway, let's consider this example. Let me ask this question. You take two by two matrix A, and you raise it to this huge power, 1,973. Okay, this, this is not very special number. It's just a year when I was born. Okay, anyway, you raise it to this power, and you ask a question, is it possible that this power of this matrix is just identity. Again, this power is nothing, it's a shortcut for long product, A times A times A times A times A, 1,973 times. Okay, you ask a question, do we have such matrix? Of course we do, we can take identity matrix. Okay, you take identity matrix and uh, of course it's gonna work. But identity matrix is not very interesting answer. So you refine your question, you ask, do we have other matrices? Maybe we don't. Maybe this is uh, identity is the only one. Okay, I must admit this is maybe not immediately easy to answer this question, but let's translate it into the language of linear transformations. Okay, uh, if I translate, I get this question. Uh, we want to find a linear transformation of the plane such that it's not an identity, but such that if you compose it with itself 1973 times, you get identity map. Some transformation of the plane, such that if you repeat it many 1973 times, you just get identity. Okay, if you remember example with rotation, which we considered already twice, this may give you some hint. You say, oh, wait. If I rotate by angle theta, and then I rotate twice, then this is just rotation by angle two theta. And if I rotate 1,973 times, then this is just a rotation by 1,973 times theta. And uh, what if I take theta to be two pi over 1,973 times? It's just rotation with very small length angle. But if you do it a lot of times, you get this rotation by two pi. It's a composition. This, uh, if you take a composition of such rotations, you get rotation by two pi. But the rotation by the angle two pi is identity because two pi is the same as zero, yeah? It's an angle. 
So this gives you the clue how to answer this question. And now we translate it back in the language of matrices because basically the question is about matrices. Okay, and we get this. We fix this theta and uh, you take A to be the matrix of rotation by the uh, angle theta clock counterwise. Yeah, so basically A is this matrix. Clearly it's not identity. Yeah, cosine is not zero sign. It's not zero, yeah. Uh, but if you compose it, this, uh, if you compose this linear transformation 1973 times, you get rotation by two pi, this is identity. So it means that power of A is identity, this power of A, yeah. Okay, uh, this answer this question. Of course, if we're curious about, we can ask another question, we can refine this question. How do we have other matrices like this? We found one, do we have other? Well, of course we have other matrices like this. So for example, we can take this matrix, which we already found, and you can raise it to any power you want. You can take square of this matrix or cube. And of course, the same algebraic condition gonna be satisfied. This is easy to see. I mean, basically because you just play in the powers of matrices. But this give you more matrices like this. To be precise, it give you 1,973 matrices like this, including identity. But we want more. Do we have more matrices like this? Yeah, we have. But this is uh, a bit uh, kind of tricky to guess all of them. Let me just give you the, the answer. Uh, you take any matrix M, any two by two matrix M, but invertible. Take any two by two matrix M, with non-zero determinant. It's invertible. And then instead of matrix A or A to the power of N, you could cook up this matrix. M times A to the power of N times M inverse. Yeah, you get this. And then you just raise it to the power 1973. This is just a long product. And then when you take this bunch of matrices, all this M times M minus one cancel and you get identity and identity times anything is anything. So you simplify this power like this, but then you know that this product is just this, it's just a shortcut for this, but this is its identity. And then eventually you get M times M inverse, which is identity by definition. This gives you infinitely many matrices A. So if you replace your original A by this guy, yeah. So uh, this is an interesting question. Yeah, of course, final question you may ask, do we have other matrices like this? Maybe this is all. Uh, I guess we don't have any other matrices. I think this is it. This is all matrices with, which give you solution of this equation. But we don't know yet enough tools to solve this. Soon we will learn these tools and we'll be able to solve this. Okay, now what we're gonna do is the following in the rest of this lecture. We have a lot of things we defined for matrices. Now we want to translate a lot of the things into the language of linear transformations to see the siblings. Yeah, the mirrors. And uh, okay, so we start with invertible matrices. We already know what is invertible matrix. It's uh, A is invertible. If there exists matrix B, such that AB equal identity and BA is also equal identity. What translation of this definition in the language of uh, linear transformations? Okay, we fix a linear transformation that maps vectors from n-dimensional space to m-dimensional space. And we say that T is invertible if it has an inverse, which is also linear transformation. Okay, this is actually translation to what I just said, because if you just apply this uh, bridge between this two worlds of matrices and linear transformation, you get definition of invertible matrices. Yeah, because instead of T, you just need to take uh, standard matrix of T. And if it's invertible, there exists another matrix as a standard matrix of T times B is identity and the uh, other way around. But this is exactly uh, this definition. Yeah, okay. So look, but this definition in some sense even maybe more natural than definition for invertible matrices. Because 
uh, invertible intuitively means uh, your function is bijection and you just take an inverse map. But we don't know that the inverse map is also linear. So basically this is a crucial thing. So this is, should be like something like bijection plus the inverse map should be linear. In fact, using machinery of matrices, we can say more. We have the three conditions which are equivalent. T is invertible, if and only if T is bijection, if and only if N equal to M and standard matrix of T is invertible. Of course, if standard matrix of T is invertible, we already know from results about matrices that T must be, uh, standard matrix of T must be square matrix, so T must be M. But this is interesting, you see, here it's not a priori clear why in this definition of invertibility, why n should be equal to m, but we can prove it. Okay, uh, good. So, uh, detailed proof of this result is in the lecture notes. Let me just briefly mention the proof of one direction of this arrow. So, if t is bijection, that t is invertible, and actually n equals m. Okay. Uh, and from what I'm gonna say, uh, from my proof will follow also that T is invertible. If you use uh, one of the equivalent conditions for a matrix to be invertible. Remember for matrix, we uh, know a lot of 12 equivalent conditions of being invertible, which we listed in the uh, last lecture. So basically, if you give me a matrix, we have tons of conditions to check that it's invertible or not including nice condition uh, using determinants. Yeah, square matrix is invertible if and only if it's determinant is not zero, which is actually quite handy. I, fi I find it very handy. Okay, let's prove that if T is bijective, that T is invertible, N equals to M, and actually uh, standard matrix of T is invertible. So we assume that T is bijective. Yeah, and now we use the help of our uh, translation. We translate a little bit everything into the language of matrices because we, for matrices we already know a lot of things. You take uh, standard matrix of T. This is a matrix, M times N matrix. Okay. Then we also know from this trans big theorem about translation that if you translate back, if you take matrix A and take its linear transformation which correspond to this this gothic t subscript a this one yeah then you get back t so this is basically what is this this is a linear transformation applied by multiplication by the matrix a okay good now let's check what the kernel of a kernel of a it's all elements such that a times x is zero but a times x by this it's just t of x but T of X is bijection by assumption. So what does it mean? It means that only one element can go to zero, zero. So bijection means it's one-to-one -one and onto. We use here the fact that it's one-to-one. -one. Uh, let me remind you, bijection is one-to-one -one and onto. So we use here that T is one-to-one. -one. So if T of X is zero, X must be zero. So what we just proved. We prove this kernel of A is a zero vector space. But now we can use our most favorite result, <laughs> rank nullity theorem. We apply rank nullity theorem and we say rank of matrix A must be N by the rank nullity theorem, which we can use anytime we want. This means the dimension of the column space is N. Okay, we use onto. But we didn't use, oh, we used uh, one to one. We didn't use onto. Now let me use onto. The fact that T is onto. So we, what does it mean? It means that for every vector in RM, there exists vector in RM such that uh, T of this vector is this vector in RM. So let me give names to these vectors. For every vector Y in RM, you can find vector X in RM such that T of X is Y. This means T is onto. Okay, but now we say, oh, wait, wait. We already know that T of X is just AX. But as I already mentioned today, and as I already mentioned last lecture, and I will mention this many times in the future, 
when you have a matrix A and multiplied by vector X, this is a linear combination of columns of A. Okay? Whose coefficients of this linear combination are coordinates of vector X. So anyway, we know that AX lives in the columns, column space. Yeah? And what we, what we just this proved that column space is RM because column space lives in M-dimensional space. Yeah? And we just proved that every vector in the RM can, can be obtained as a linear composition of the column space. So it means column space is RM. Okay. But we already know that dimension of column space is N, <laughs> but dimension of RM is M. So M must be equal to N. So we proved this. Okay. And since kernel of A is zero, we also know that matrix A is invertible by one of these equivalent conditions, but one of these equivalent conditions of the invertibility of the matrix. Yeah. And now we take inverse of your matrix A and trans take, translate everything back into the uh, language of linear transformation. And this gives you the matrix uh, linear transformation, which is actually inverse of T. And we basically also gonna prove this formula. Inverse of the standard matrix of T, it's standard matrix of the inverse of T, if T is invertible. Otherwise, of course, none of this is defined. Okay, this was maybe a bit too fast, a bit too sketchy, but again, look uh, for the detailed proof in the lecture notes or in the book. Okay, so now let us translate uh, what is this notion of kernel and the uh, image, uh, kernel and the column space of the matrix. For every matrix, you have two vector subspaces related to the matrix kernel of the matrix, which lives in RM, and column space, which lives in RM. Similarly, to every linear transformation, we can correspond two objects, two vector subspaces, which are going to be translation of kernel and the column space, which is given on the next slide. So by definition, the image of a linear transformation T is a subset consisted of all vectors in RM, such that they are images of some vectors in RN. So by the, basically I use this image word quite often. Uh, if you never heard what image before, so it's this. So uh, you take all vectors in RM, you apply your linear transformation T to them, you get bunch of vectors in RM. This is your image. So basically you take this guy, RM, and you map it here what you get is your image, yeah. So, of course, I define it as a set, but of course this is, as we will see in a second, this is a linear subspace. But similarly, you can define the kernel of the linear transformation. Kernel of the linear transformation, all vectors in Rn, which maps to zero, yeah. And uh, here are a few examples. Our, for example, favorite, uh, not favorite, maybe one uh, favorite technical, favorite technical example. If you have a linear subspace of Rn, you can define orthogonal projection to V. Then by one of the properties, by the orthogonal decomposition theorem, image of this projection is V. And the kernel, by definition, it's a orthogonal complement to V. Everything which orthogonal to V goes to zero. And of course, you can get every vector in V using this uh, orthogonal projection because every vector in V is mapped to itself. Okay, good. And this is the lemma which tells you how to that uh, our definition image of image and the kernel of the linear uh, operator uh, can be obtained as a translation for the column space and the kernel of the standard matrix of T. Yeah. So in particular, this means that these two sets of course, not just sets, uh, the vector uh, subspaces of Rn and Rm respectively. So uh, I must warn you on this point that in some books, uh, you study linear transformation before matrices. We did other way around. We, studied, we started with matrices and ended up with linear transformation. 
it's possible to study linear algebra in the opposite direction. You start with linear transformation and you go to matrices and you introduce all of the things uh, uh, for matrices in terms of linear transformations. Yeah, this is, all, uh, this is also possible approach which is uh, used in many books on linear algebra. Okay, again, image of your linear transformation is nothing but the column space of a standard matrix. This follows from the important remark observation, which I used many times, already used in this lecture, uh, used many times earlier. This is a very uh, important observation. So basically it means if you take a vector X multiplied by matrix A, what you get is a composition of columns of matrix A. This is implies this. And kernel, this is basically by uh, almost by definition, if you use this theorem, which translates your uh, linear transformation into matrices. Okay, good. This is important things, how they match. And finally, our favorite result, uh, rank nullity theorem. <laughs> Let's <laughs> translate rank nullity theorem in the language of linear transformation law using this lemma. You have linear transformation and you can define the rank of linear transformation as a dimension of the image, yeah? And you can define the nullity of uh, linear transformation as a dimension of the kernel. Of course, we know by the previous lemma that this is just the rank of the standard matrix of T and the nullity of standard matrix of T. But again, if you wish, you can use this as a definition, yeah? And uh, we have this criterion, T is injective, if and only if kernel of T is zero, if and only if nullity of T is zero. So he zero is a zero vector space and he zero is a number. Similarly, T is surjective onto, if and only if image of T is the whole space RM. Yeah, this is basically by definition. And this is if and only if rank of T is M. Okay, and uh, this is special case of what we already discussed when we define the inverse of matrix here, yeah, because if inverse of mat, uh, if inverse of uh, linear transformation exists, then of course this we proved uh, that the kernel must be zero and the image must be the whole space it must be bijective and it, mu it must be uh, onto and uh, and uh, one to one. Injective is one to one, surjective is onto. Okay. And uh, in a sp very special case, when linear transformation goes from Rn to Rm, when n is m, all of these conditions coincide. Injectivity, bijectivity, and surjectivity. This is very similar uh, uh, when you consider finite sets. If you have finite sets and you have maps between them, you have inj injective maps, surjective maps, uh, but if you have uh, finite sets with the same number of elements, or if you have a map from sinus, uh, finite set to itself, then being injective, bijective, and surjective is the same thing. This is more or less follows from uh, elementary, like basically like pigeonhole principle. He is roughly the same thing. Yeah, it's uh, and it follows from uh, this thing. Yeah, it follows from the things and from the criterion which we. Uh, proof of the criterion which we for the for the in, uh, linear transformation to be invertible. Okay, we have this detailed proof of all of these facts are in the lecture notes, but they are very in intuitive, and uh, I strongly suggest to try to prove them by yourself. And finally, our favorite result, rank nullity theorem. If you have a linear transformation, that uh, its rank plus nullity is n. Yeah. Okay. Good. This is good. And actually, if you reread the proof of rank nullity theorem for matrices, you will see somewhere between the lines that we implicitly use linear transformations, implicitly. So basically, if you want to prove this uh, theorem, there's two ways how you what you can do. One way, you just translate this into language of matrices. And of course you get a rank of the standard uh, matrix of T plus nullity of the standard matrix of T equals to N. This is this translation. We already proved this. But 
I suggest you take the proof of random nullity theorem, which we did in the previous lecture, and you just use the proof, you translate the whole proof into the language of linear transformation. And you actually notice that it's going to be simpler a little bit. So psychologically, maybe it's going to be more complicated, but really it's going to be simpler. Okay, and let me finish by one example, uh, just basically to show how this spaces looks like, which you already know is just in, using the language of linear transformation. You have this map from R3 to R4, basically given by this formula. Okay, good. What's the image? What's the kernel? Kernel, all the vectors in R3, which goes to zero. But it's clear it goes to zero if X2 and X3 is zero. So you have this. Yeah, what's the image? But it's clear the image consists of all vectors that looks like this for any X2, X3. So it's given by equation Y3 equal Y4 equal to zero. Where, yeah. So this is basically follows from the formula. This is just illustration of these two notions. Yeah. And if you take corresponding matrix of T, you get this matrix. Yeah, which may remind you a little bit about the homework problem. Yeah. Okay. Let me stop here. Let me stop recording. Okay. Bye.